the human security theme is uh, the discussion we are having today with uh, parliamentarians, ongoing parliamentarians, at present uh, parliamentarians, past parliamentarians, uh, but also lawmakers and specialists in this field. Uh, the discussion is how we make human security central to uh, the deliberations of parliaments, central to the political arena, how we make sure that this notion of human security can contribute really to peace and security worldwide, and how it can be applied uh, not just as a checklist, but really as a practical tool for parliamentarians uh, to, uh, to do what is supposed to be, uh, that is to be the accelerator for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals that, as we know, are lagging behind. 30% of the goals are not probably achievable by 2030. But now, what we have to do? We have to find a way, maybe resort to what uh, some time ago was thought of as the um, clinical method, the formula, uh, to, to do that happen. And this is human security. Human security is a notion that is based on social equity, on human needs, on sustainable livelihood opportunities. And we want to hear from the uh, specialists today, uh, really how that is applicable, how that becomes something that can function, can change uh, the political discourse and make it focused on what people need, what people need, what does it take to make this happen. So with me today, uh, I'm very pleased to have, first of all, Saber Choudhury. Saber, I introduced him a minute ago, uh, is not only member of parliament in Bangladesh, but he is the present minister for environment, forest and climate change. He has been president of the Interparliamentary Union for quite a term, an important term, from 2014 to 2017, and he is a man for peace. He is the voice of the Interparliamentary Union, IPU, when we talk about peace. And this session is about peace primarily. So thank you, Saber, for being with us. We also have uh, Dennis Donton. Dennis Norton is from Ireland. He is the chairman of the Interparliamentary Union Working Group on Science and Technology. He is a member of parliament for over three decades and also a great promoter of uh, this, I can already anticipate, of the concept of human security well beyond the sphere of IPU. We also have with us uh, a junior specialist, but extremely competent, Arthur Duforest, who is a disarmament and conflict uh, management expert, is a consultant and member of the European Leadership Network, Arthur. Well, uh, they told me to invert the order. I would have put women first, but uh, we have two uh, quite authoritative uh, ladies with us today. The first one is Laurence Marzal. Uh, Laurence, welcome to you. Uh, she is the secretary of the Standing Committee of Peace and Security in IPU, Interparliamentary Union, uh, and of course, also a senior program officer. She is the one who is promoting, uh, really behind the scenes, the concept of human security across the parliamentary arena, uh, well beyond the IPU itself. So thank you for being with us. And uh, I'm also pleased, as I was telling you, I am here in Zagreb, that I'm joined by a specialist, here she is, Dora Damjanovic. She is a social entrepreneur, uh, and she is a communication specialist. Being a communication specialist, she will be in the right spot to tell us what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong, in order to communicate to parliamentarians, communicate to lawmakers, what we went, want to do. So thank you for being with us, uh, Dora, last minute. And I also want to thank uh, uh, our friend uh, Federica Donati, who will be the rapporteur of this session. So uh, please look at our website, uh, the World Academy of Earth Science website, where you will find 
a full report on this session. So I was uh, introducing the concept of human security, uh, what it means, uh, what are the values behind human security. Um, but now I want to hear from all of you. Let's start from Sober. Sober, what is for you the concept of human security? What does it stand for? And why do you think it is important to make use of it right now? Thank you. Sober. Thank you, Nato. And uh, wonderful to see uh, so many uh, familiar faces who are friends, and also from the IPU and uh, Dennis. And I always know that Gary is uh, probably with us, although he's not on video, but uh, I see he's here. So uh, greetings from Bangladesh. Um, moving on to your question, you know, what I understand, I don't think it's a concept. You know, I think we have to stop talking about it as a concept. I think it's a very practical tool. Uh, it's a very effective lens when we as parliamentarians try to understand and assess needs. You know, that's where I would first start. And uh, if I try to uh, juxtapose that with the uh, responsibilities and duties of parliamentarians, and if I can, without oversimplifying, broadly say that, you know, our main function is that of representation. So what are we representing? Um, we are representing potential solutions, and we are trying to tailor that to the needs of the people. You know, that's representation. Uh, it's trying to bring individual voices um, it is uh, trying to articulate individual concerns. So the focus is very much on the individual. And after I go through the, you know, the functions, I'll talk briefly about my experience since I've taken over the position in the executive. Next, of course, is you know, your policies, the policies that you articulate, um, the legislation that you formulate. Uh, is it to benefit nameless faces or is it to look at the demands of an individual? and try and reflect that in your policy articulation and law formulation. And last but not least is how we appropriate resources uh, through the budgetary allocation process. Um, and you know, when, when we try and, and formulate a policy, we try and look at it in terms of who are the most disadvantaged, uh, who are the most marginalized. And if you're able to do that, then the product that you will come up at the end of the day is something that is going to fit everyone's needs. So I think the, the radical and the rapid departure that we need from the traditional concept of, of security uh, is to look at it in a much more people-centered and a people-focused way. Um, you know, so when I talk about, as the Minister for Environment, you know, I talk about the impact of climate change, and then it's so very easy to get lost in numbers. You know, I'll say, the one meter rise in sea level, you know, there'll be 20 million people displaced. Um, every day, there are so many people moving from the rural to the cities. Uh, so many people are impacted by the melting of the glaciers in the Himalayas or the rising sea levels in the Bay of Bengal. But each individual is important and each individual is a story. You know? So uh, if you look at the face of the problem, it is the face of individuals, not of mass uh, communities. And I think the challenges that we face today, uh, whether that be you know, uh, economic emancipation, preventing environmental degradation, you have to have a holistic approach. Uh, these are cross-sectional, intersectional. And I think uh, we have now come at a point when the traditional security perspective has actually reached its limits. Um, it, it is not fit for purpose, if I may say that. Uh, in terms of when we approach, you know, the various challenges. Um, so what you need is, and also I think the other basic difference is in the traditional concept, uh, it's more responding to the symptoms, uh, whereas this one is actually referring to the disease. And when we look at peace also, I mean, peace isn't just the absence of conflict. Uh, it is to have the enabling conditions in place that allows me as an individual to thrive and live up to my full potential. So you know, it's the same when we talk about climate change, do you talk about adaptation or do you talk about mitigation? So we talk about solving the problem at its roots. Um, so we need to have you know, more mitigation. We need to solve the problem faster than we are creating it. Same if you look at the discourse on uh, disasters. And at one time disasters were looked at in terms of what you do after a disaster. 
uh, in terms of rehabilitation, in terms of pushing resources. Now we are trying to, the paradigm shift has been to move to risk prevention. So, you know, prevention also becomes important. And when I look at, uh, when I look at the, uh, the needs of the society, I'm not just protecting them, I'm actually empowering them, uh, which is something that I need. So it's not just human security, it doesn't involve protection of individuals, it actually involves empowerment of individuals. And um, so in, you know, when we talk about most vulnerable countries and we talk about most vulnerable communities, we have actually taken a step in Bangladesh to identify the most vulnerable individuals because the needs of the community is not homogeneous. You know, within the community, there'll be various levels of, uh, of the uh, capacity or the ability to respond to the challenges, you know, their adaptive capacity. Uh, so to me, as I've said, it is an extremely effective tool for parliamentarians. It is something extremely practical. It's not an abstract concept. And I think, you know, when we mention the term concept to parliamentarians, and they say, here we go, this is another concept. So this is a tool that actually delivers. That is a tool that allows us to be better public representatives. Uh, this is a tool that allows us to understand their needs, to hear them uh, much more quickly. And you know, the more we do that, the more we reach out to the people, I think the more effective we become as parliamentarians. Uh, so this is actually a tool for us uh, to engage uh, with communities, um, and so, and you know, when you do that, when you try and empower them, what you're also doing, and this is my last point, because I'm sure others will also speak and I can come back later, is how, to, how can we free them from short, medium, and long-term threats? So protection, empowerment together, addressing the root causes of the threats and empowering the individual. And if you can empower the individual, then this is something that extends to all of society. You know, so we are only as strong and we are only as resilient as the individual. So if the individual is resilient, the community is. And if the community is, you know, the society at large and the country. Sorry, I didn't want to, you know, speak that long, but I just wanted to, you know, respond um, oh, and it's share a, my... It's a, pleasure, it's a pleasure and an honor for us, Sober, to have you here. Thank you for your time, uh, really. And I think that you already set the stage for this conversation, because it's important as, to correct me somehow also when I speak about approach. You spoke about tool uh, and the practicality in, in reality is really what we want to see how we can make sure that the, not this approach, but this tool uh, that is focused around several dimensions, as we know, the, because we're talking of human security for the health of people, for the well being of people, uh, for the needs in terms of. Uh, food and, and supplies in terms of quality of life, the environment, for sure, uh, the personal and community level, and also the technological security that is required nowadays, needs uh, particular recognition. And uh, here we come with Dennis, uh, Dennis Noton. Uh, Dennis, uh, I think you are working hard in terms of making the notion and the, and the tool uh, of, uh, of human security being recognized. Uh, the formal recognition of human security, do you think that is something that is needed nowadays? Uh, and why now? Uh, since this, uh, this notion exists already for over 20 years in the UN environment, but as we know, the, there are a couple of millennia at least that we're talking about security and human security. So what makes it so cogent, Why, what makes it so imperative for our society to understand its, its possible application? Thank you. Well, look, I, I think coming back to what uh, Sabir said, I think human security is a tool uh, and it provides us with a different viewpoint on, on solving problems. And I think for us as members of parliament, we've been using human security uh, for as long as parliamentary representation uh, has uh, been developed. But I suppose the actual concept and the construct that is there uh, is a relatively new concept. So I suppose, look, for, for members of parliament, look, on a daily basis, we're dealing with various issues from individuals, maybe with uh, 
an issue regarding housing and addressing that problem for them. And at the same time, we have to be regulating uh, complex entities like and abstract entities like artificial intelligence. And on top of that, then holding government to account on a daily basis as well. And um, what human security does is it provides us with a tool where we can look at these issues, whether they're individual problems or whether they're global challenge, challenges uh, through a particular uh, viewpoint. I think what human security does is that it encourages all of us to place the individual at the heart of our problem solving uh, strategy. And look, we as politicians, we can't neglect that. If we do, we're not going to be uh, reelected. I think it's a tool that um, allows us maybe to uh, check ourselves to make sure that we're keeping the individual in the focus of whatever policy development we're doing. However, I think where it's really important for, for parliamentarians is when we get people to work with us. By explaining the concept of human security to them, we can explain the needs of individuals and get them to orientate their work or their policy to actually address the issues that are being faced by people and provide very practical uh, solutions. So at the moment, I'm speaking to you from Tbilisi in, in Georgia, uh, which is hitting the headlines at the moment. But I'm here talking with science communicators from all over Europe, uh, and they're expressing the challenge to me. Well, how do they engage with Parliament? How do they engage with the governments uh, and policy uh, people uh, in government? And how do they get their research evidence uh, filtering through the policy process? And I'm explaining to them that using human security as a tool and a viewpoint in presenting their evidence ensures that the members of parliament, the civil servants that are drafting policy or the government ministers can actually understand that research, can see the implications of that research, and can then apply that research in a very practical way in adopting policies. So look, I'm talking in the abstract at the moment, but to give you two very practical examples. So uh, I chair a parliamentary committee uh, in Ireland, uh, where one of our responsibilities is supporting island communities, particularly off the, the west coast of Ireland in the Atlantic Ocean. And recently, uh, we uh, visited uh, some of those islands and we uh, were looking at academic research uh, that is taking place in those island communities. But rather than have the academics from the various universities present uh, to the committee on what they're doing, we actually got the islanders themselves to explain to us the impacts of that research on their day-to-day -day, day -day lives. So... The researchers were there supporting them, but the evidence was given by the individual islanders. And that forced the academic community to look at how they're delivering their research results, evidence and impact from the perspective of the islanders. So it's a reorientation of the view in relation to it. And like Saber, I was formerly uh, an environment minister in Ireland. I was Ireland's first climate uh, action minister. And one of the things that I did uh, as minister was uh, develop this concept of, of climate dialogue, where we would actually take the experts in, in climate change uh, and take those people that are drafting government policy and bring them down into the communities that have been directly impacted uh, by climate change. So one of the first communities we brought them to were communities in the middle of Ireland uh, where there had been uh, torrential flooding uh, in two consecutive uh, winters. Uh, homes and communities devastated. And we started the work there with them, looking at the issues and challenges that they have and articulating that then to a wider public. But we also appointed climate ambassadors these were individuals living in these communities, older retired people, young students who we worked with, we trained and we supported to explain to them the challenges and issues in terms of climate change. So they could go back into their own communities and work with those communities and explain to them in ordinary language what needs to be done 
and how they can help in moving that climate agenda along. So it's very much about uh, providing people themselves with the tools to make a real impact in policy and in legislation. And I think what human security does, it provides us with a universally applicable tool uh, to ensure that our policies and our solutions and our actions as parliamentarians are actually effective in actually delivering for individuals, uh, for communities, and for our country uh, as a whole. And that's what it's about. It's a way of thinking that prioritizes the well-being uh, of individuals and people, putting people first. And I think it reflects very well uh, in terms of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is about uh, leaving no one uh, behind. And I suppose in an abstract way, you, you could consider human security a bit like imagining a puzzle. There are many different pieces to that puzzle. Uh, and there are different ways that that puzzle can be put together. And you have to work with those different formats to actually solve the problem and maybe solve multiple problems for multiple communities uh, at the one time. And I think it's a way of helping to address complex challenges, you know, not just dealing with one problem, but the implications of that problem for other communities and for other individuals, be it personal safety, be it employment and jobs, or even basic human dignity like sanitation. And I think that's what it does. It allows us to develop more equitable solutions that cover multiple aspects and problems and challenges and look at it in a multi-dimensional uh, element rather than purely uh, a one track, one silo approach, which we see in a lot of government departments where it's very much they solve their individual problem and not look at the implications in other government departments or the implications for other communities. Um, so it's a bit like river uh, management. Uh, you know, the implications upstream can have detrimental impact uh, on communities downstream. And it's about having uh, an approach that looks at the whole length of, of the river and not just one uh, micro uh, element uh, of the problem. That is perfect. I think you not only you unpacked the subject, but you, you gave us really hints in terms of how to elaborate the policies uh, that will appeal, and, and not only appeal to people, but will make sure that people are the real contributors uh, of uh, the, the, the laws, of the regulations, of the measures that need to be taken to make sure that human security is taken into account. Uh, I, I think you, you have remarked the importance, we call it often ownership, uh, we call it often sustainability, uh, but you have shown me also with your example, uh, the fact that uh, really it is also about people. It is about uh, the grassroots. It is about really the, the human dimension uh, that is, uh, uh, so sacred to all of us, and it's obviously is the beginning of everything. Uh, so this has to be uh, uh, endured, has to be continued. Uh, I'm sure you have the determination uh, to do that. So you are a champion in uh, in uh, for human security in, in IPU and beyond. And we count, of course, as we count on Saber uh, to be leading us to be leading us uh, towards uh, the. Uh, programming that we are currently undertaking with IPU uh, for capacity building also, for the element of capacity building of human security. And here we come to Laurence, Laurence Marzal, uh, that uh, uh, is uh, the real promoter, I was saying, uh, of this uh, chapter of work in IPU. Uh, so again, the question is the same for you. Where where do you think we are right now? Is uh, human security already uh, an accepted tool, uh, Laurence, uh, and uh, is this tool understood? What are the next steps in order to make sure that uh, we are really making uh, available uh, to, to everybody, to parliamentarians first, uh, to politicians in general, uh, we're making a set of uh, knowledge, a set of competencies uh, that uh, they can use in different fields. Besides, you also have passed recently a very important resolution in IPU that is uh, about uh, the diplomatic uh, 
the, the, diplom the, the efforts, diplomatic efforts, uh, and uh, uh, the importance of uh, opening uh, a public dialogue uh, in with uh, with many actors beyond the parliamentarians in IPU. So maybe you can tell us something also about the recent resolution about public diplomacy uh, and parliamentary diplomacy that will become uh, so effective, uh, we hope so, in the years to come. Laurence? Yeah, thank you very much, Donato. Um, well, and I'm, I'm talking just after two office holders of the IPU, so I'm not going to go against what they just said about human security. Um, definitely, uh, and especially because just between brackets, uh, Saber, before becoming the IPU president, uh, was the president of the um, Standing Committee on Peace and International Security, and I had um, the um, the honor uh, of working directly with him uh, at that time. So, uh, and we started working on human security when he was the president of of the Standing Committee. So, uh, nothing new under the sun on on this. Uh, and uh, and I see that um, the vision has uh, has evolved um, uh, with the years. Um, my my stance will be on how the IPU promotes human security and and what uh, what it is for the IPU. Um, and as uh, Saber and Dennis uh, uh, stated, uh, human security uh, is definitely to be taken as a lens for decision makers, uh, and this is what we are promoting. We're trying to uh, really help them. Um, recenter the work that they do around the human component and 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 so that they can bring forward a new pattern a new security pattern by which they uh, will get away from you know something very confrontational when it comes to security but rather think in terms of uh, what makes my citizen my people the, the people that i'm representing what makes them secure and how can i address all the root causes of insecurity so that all these people feel secure and can thrive. And that's exactly what, what uh, uh, Saber said uh, earlier. It's really the idea of making sure that parliamentarians are at the service of the people and bring them this security environment. And so, as, as we already said, um, I mean, as they already said, and I'm going to hammer this information, uh, is really um, the fact of being inclusive. So the people that are facing a challenge are the first one able to tell you what is a challenge and how they want uh, you to tackle it. Uh, and it's better because they will feel ownership of the solution uh, rather than, than something that will come out of the blue uh, and be imposed on them. And that's one very important aspect of uh, human security. Um, another uh, thing is uh, this whole idea of, and, and I think both of them uh, spoke about it, um, it's the ecosystem. So instead of working in silo, members of parliament have that capacity of going to one, uh, to one department to another and try to bring in all this information so that they can really deliver uh, something that will be multidimensional and will help the people in the various dimensions of human security, but at the end of the day, of their life. Um, and it's and it's all about life. <laughs> uh, it's all about human, and it's all about life and how you want to uh, you, you can help those people. Uh, and and at the end of the day, it's all about development. And as you say, Donato. Uh, human security is also a way to achieve the SDGs. <clears throat> um, you, you mentioned the issue uh, of uh, parliamentary diplomacy. Um, let me go back a little bit. Uh, Saber said that human security is a tool and Dennis that it is an approach. Um, sorry if I have to choose one or the other, but I would go for the approach. Uh, simply because for me the tools are the um, the the functions of MPs, the main functions, and they can. I mean, the approach can better 
the tools and the way the tools will be used. Um, and so we've spoke about representation. That is one of the main functions of parliamentarians. They also draft legislation. They also allocate budget. They also uh, hold government into account. That's oversight. And we've added a fifth function uh, at the IPU, which is parliamentary diplomacy. Parliamentary diplomacy is um, it's between parliaments, so between our members and between the delegates of our members. When uh, um, a, an MP from Bangladesh speaks to an MP um, of, of Ireland and discuss different uh, ways of doing things, learn from each other, uh, share tips, um, that's parliamentary diplomacy also and so um you mentioned the uh, the last um declaration um that was uh, adopted in in march this year uh it the, uh, the declaration is in reality the outcome of the general debate that um took place during the assembly and indeed um the general debate was on um parliamentary diplomacy and it was, and it also uh, was about how can we better the life of our people by using parliamentary diplomacy. How can we better talk to each other to tackle together global challenges? Because it's better to do it together rather than being confrontational and 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 losing it. Um, and and in fact, and I've done my homework. I have my papers with me. Um, I just want to uh, share with you um, one sentence of that declaration, uh, which has been endorsed by the assembly. So it's an official document um, whereby the um, um, the 148 uh, assembly said that the participants say that we should therefore increase our efforts on human security, which encompasses citizens protection by prioritizing essential needs such as food, health care, and environmental security and on guarantee, guaranteeing equal rights for all as the main path for fostering both peace and development. Um, and I think that this, this declaration is a very important one. Um, it's really hard to build bridges between peace and development and human security is at the core of this. Laurence, thank you very much for your answer for elaborating further on the concept or tool in the end is not just a matter of terminology is the willingness to make this operational and it's already operational and this is what we are happy to hear from you about also about the uh, public diplomacy uh, importance the sorry the, the, the parliamentary diplomacy um, and the liberations that have been taken by ipu i want to thank uh, Arthur and uh, Dennis, who put on our uh, webinar chat uh, some important resources, the declaration itself, uh, and uh, the uh, reports on climate action and uh, engaging with island communities that Dennis was referring to. So please uh, take a note, I say that also to our secretariat, because these are important resources uh, for the future. Uh, uh, to all uh, participants that are not, uh, will not be able to speak, uh, but are with us today, I would urge them to ask questions or make comments in the chat. And we will have Dora Damianovic later who will moderate uh, and pick some or one or two questions uh, out of those who you have and uh, produce that uh, and, and present that to all of us. And, uh, and we will try to respond. Uh, now uh, is the turn of Arthur Dufore. Arthur, uh, we are working together. You are also an associate fellow of the World Academy, uh, you know already what I'm going to ask you is, uh, how are we going ahead with this important uh, uh, training? Uh, because we are now poised towards having uh, a training package soon for parliamentarians. And what is the approach that we are taking together, IPU and WASP, uh, in terms of promoting a, a sort of micro-learning, uh, but it's also a self-paced micro-learning uh, as a sort of memento, as a sort of vademecum for parliamentarians, so that whenever needed, 
they can have something handy and say, this is the way that I can work. This is the way that I can uh, be up to speed with the requirements of the human security agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Donato. Um, so some of the work that we're doing, you said it's important. I would even add that it's uh, a gigantic task uh, because what we're trying to achieve here and what we're aspiring to help parliamentarians achieve is to redefine uh, peace processes and, and conflict prevention and redefine generally how we think of security. It's been mentioned here and there throughout the, the previous uh, conversations or the previous interventions, but it, it's clear that if you define security in confrontational terms, you only get confrontational answers. Um, and therefore, that's why redefining security under the idea of, of human security is so critical uh, for the path ahead. And this is an observation that you know I'm making here right now, but that um, we at the IPU have been observing for many years. Um, in fact, uh, what really kick-started this, this whole process uh, and really cemented the idea of uh, the importance of human security in parliamentary work was an IPU resolution titled Rethinking and Reframing the Approach to Peace Processes with a View to Fostering Lasting Peace. And this really, this really was the culmination of uh, years of work that consisted of pointing out all those flaws in uh, the current systems, one of them being the idea that the term security for many parliamentarians just meant, you know, out of my hands, security is um, the, the prerogative of the government um, and, and not a matter of parliament, which is completely false and, and sort of a misconception that we're fighting against. And and um, uh, working to disprove every day and helping parliamentarians disprove every day. Laurence mentioned oversight. Um, and um, so this work has led us to, to collaborate with the World Academy of Art and Science. Um, some of the work that we've done thus far, we've done many webinars. Again, um, you know, something that is so core to human security is the idea that no one really wants pre-baked answers being dropped on their plate as in here this will solve all your problems this is not what human security tries to do and this is also not how we want to present human security we're not here to tell parliamentarians here's how to do things but really present this um this approach that contextualize their or like intentional uses of their functions that will further um, the, the the concepts or the, the approach of human security. Um, so, for example, what we've been doing uh, with the micro learning courses that we've been developing um, since January is really looking at what representation means, how, can parla how do parliamentarians carry out representation, and how can they carry out representation in a way that allows citizens to formulate their problem along the lines of human security, so that parliamentarians can later respond to those problems along the lines of human security. And um, this idea of really bringing your constituents as a parliamentarian, bringing your constituents as part of the answer to a problem, that's empowerment, really the... Um, and so this is what I mean when I say that no one wants a pre-baked answer, you wanna be part of the, uh, you wanna be part of the, uh, of the solution. And this is also what we're doing with parliamentarians. So we've carried out multiple webinars, and consultations to really engage parliamentarian on what their vision is of human security, what their vision is of the uh, the flaws and the what's lacking in the current processes and the current decision making processes. How do they see themselves fitting? How do they represent their population, their their citizens? And building, you know, webinar by webinar, conversation by conversation, um, resolution by resolution, where we're culminating into something where we have. Um, a pretty clear idea of how parliamentarians understand it and how to best advertise it to them um, and how to best promote it to them. Advertising is perhaps not the right, the right term, promote, promote it to them. Um, and so in doing so, we've really contextualized these. So we have eight, um, eight courses that the first one being an introduction to human security, then um, what human security means to parliamentarians. Then we have all five, um, all five uh, parliamentary functions. And then we end um, with a final course that sort of ties back to previous efforts. Something that's very interesting with human security is that since it is such a broad uh, and encompassing uh, approach, um, to many, and, and you know, Mr. Noton and Mr. Chowdhury here 
um, really would agree with this. You know, human security is uh, at, the, at the heart of, of parliamentary work because you're supposed to represent your constituents. You're supposed to work towards solving their, their issues. And um, parliamentarians did not wait uh, uh, for 1994 and the UNDP report to, to start working at this. And so I think human security is really bringing this back up and the, the concept is bringing this idea back up and revitalizing this. And that's what I mean when I say that this is a gigantic task in the sense that um, um, parliamentarians always had the tools to answer to the, the problems of their constituents. Um, and some of them just need a little hand and, and a direction and human security can be this direction where it doesn't tell you what to do, but it shows you how to connect the dots. It helps you achieve the um, uh, sustainable development goals, which in of themselves are fantastic tools that some parliamentarians find hard to uh, to reference, and the IPU has done some work on that as well. I'll I'll share it in the in the chat a little later. Um, and uh, this is so those are some of our efforts, which are you know hopefully um, uh, bearing fruits. And and the fact that we have Mr. Chowdhury and Mr. Norton here, I think, uh, is a, a, a sort of a proof of that. Um, and we're currently working very hard on a publication that will summarize about two and a half, three years worth of findings, uh, discussions and, and resolutions to really um, share what we've learned from parliamentarians on how to best uh, promote the concept and best integrate it. A lot of work. But before we go for a second quick round, uh, I would thank you very much, Arthur. Really, uh, we, as you know, we are enthusiastic as World Academy to continue the collaboration with IPU. As you said, we are just at the beginning. There is already a wealth of knowledge that is being shared as we speak, and we are learning a lot at the same time. So this is a two-way street process that is uh, already bringing fruits. Uh, but let me uh, let give the floor now to um, our friend, uh, uh, Dora Damianovic, that uh, uh, first of all, I want to ask you as an expert in uh, communication and uh, and also an expert uh, in marketing. I mean, and how to market and what uh, uh, messages uh, of, of this importance. Mm -hmm. Do you think we are doing the right thing, Dora? Uh, what uh, what should we be doing in order to influence lawmakers, politicians in general, and make sure that the as we said, the concept, the tools. Uh, the uh, understanding in terms of what are the priorities for human beings is really reflected, mm -hmm. reflected in laws, in, the, in measures that can make life better for all. Well, I think uh, Donat and I are here on a beautiful conference in Zagreb and we had similar discussion yesterday. Uh, we were discussing actually uh, SDG, Seven Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030. And talking about Agenda 2030, that is human security. But how many people, especially looking at the general public, know that? Because what we noticed is that most of the people, when you ask them and tell them about SDGs and Agenda 2030, they think that that's something far away, related to only to institutions, related to decision-making bodies, and has nothing to do with them. General public is not aware that sustainable development goals is something that is called human security. And I would even say that some decision makers are not aware of that as well. And that's interconnected and it's impossible to separate those two because every law that is made and every action that is made is actually for the individual. And what is individual and what is human security all about if it's not for an individual? So the main challenge here is to somehow explain to people and to general public to communicate that very complex vocabulary of, let's say, big institutions like parliaments, UN, etc., to somehow translate that language to the general public and to bring awareness. Because we cannot solely rely on the institutions and organizations to work toward human security. We cannot solely rely to, to, for them to do the action to make benefit for the world. It's every single one of us. Each individual is the one who needs to do something for the human security, 
for us to achieve the goal and for us to even achieve Agenda 2030. It's not that we can only rely on institutions to do that. It's us, every individual that needs to change something and contribute in a way. So from communication side, it's very important to work on campaigns like Human Security for All, where you translate that language and where you explain to the general public that it's about them. It's about you, Donato. It's about me. It's about all of us. It's not something far away for those people, for that institutions. We all need to wake up and we all need to realize that uh, it's about us and to somehow make it closer to them and make it simplify and to realize that uh, the future is here, the future is now, and the planet is burning. So it's very important to act immediately and now. And each one of us has the power to do that, but not every one of us knows that. Dora, thank you. And since you have the floor, <laughs> uh, maybe you can also introduce one of the questions from the audience. We have, I think, one from uh, Andale. From Andale. Yes. There is one unanswered question uh, which says, should human security be expanded to social ecological security. Would, would uh, any of you like to pick on this particular question? Uh, can you show it again or can you repeat the question, please, slowly? So the question would be, should human security be expanded to social ecological security? Social ecological security. Well, certainly uh, the uh, we are talking to two, one active minister of environment and uh, the other one past minister of of environment, so they are the best person to uh, give us a hint in terms of what are we are doing. Uh, uh, is uh, human security responding to these needs? Uh, I can see that uh, Dennis is wants to take the floor. Dennis, well, I'm I'm happy to let Sabir take the floor first if he wants uh, in relation okay. to it. You first, raised then, it uh, first, but then, then oh yes, yeah, I, I, I think yeah. this is. Uh, a, a really interesting question, I think a very valid uh, question. Um, but the whole concept of hu human security is this is not isolated to an individual, but it's about taking the perspective of the individual within a community and within a society. And like while Saber and myself spoke about this as parliamentarians in day to day practice, um, Arthur and Lawrence spoke about, you know, the global aspect to this as well. And the reality is that no individual can live uh, in an environment that's hostile to life. So it has to have an ecological aspect to it. The decisions that we take on behalf of individuals or collective individuals has to, at its core, have the environmental and climate aspect incorporated uh, into that. But the only way we're actually going to be able to deliver and achieve the objectives that we have in terms of climate change is that if we can bring people along with us, leave no one behind, which is the objective behind the sustainable development goals. And the social aspect of it as well is crucially important because, you know, with climate change, uh, it's forcing many, many people to move and to migrate uh, in many parts of the world now that causes its own problem we see here in Europe at the moment in terms of the issues regarding migration. But the reality is that the vast majority of people want to remain in their own homes, in their own communities. And I think what human security does, it gives us uh, and forces us to rethink how we're supporting, you know, countries like the, the Sahel region. You know, how can we provide sustainable solutions in a region like that that supports individuals families and communities to remain on their land remain in their communities and provide them with sustainable long-term jobs um, for those communities so that's i think it's an important that's, point that's, that's been made that's but i think it is answer. it is a, a broader uh, approach this concept of human security thank you very much dennis thank you Thanks a lot. Can I, uh, uh, Sabar, can I Sabar, yes, I would like to hear from you also with respect uh, of the uh, transformation of our societies, the need uh, not only to, to, to pay lip service, sorry to say that, to ecological concerns, but really to make sure that this transformation happens. When we talk about waste management, 
uh, when we talk about recycling, when we talk about um, re reinvesting resources that had one life and then transforming them into a second life uh, that probably have also have a memory from one life to the next one. What has to be done and what kind of concerns should we take in, into in mind uh, and, and how can we do it with the human security tool? Thank you. Um, so to respond to Dora's question and to build on what Dennis said, you know, we all acknowledge the fact that this we live in a time, an era of the triple planetary crisis. So one is climate change, one is biodiversity, and the other is pollution. You know, you just referred to the waste management issue. So absolutely, I mean, those are issues that have to be factored in. And with time, you know, what conditions have to exist to ensure a peaceful and stable society? And these will vary. You know, so now, you know, someone may talk about poverty, inequality, you know, natural uh, disasters, health pandemics, environmental degradation. So it has to be the whole package. You know, it can't just be that. And I think also, if I can just go back to what Arthur and Doron's very rightly said, but I'll go a little bit further. You know, human security is not just at the heart of parliament. Human security is an absolute imperative for democracy to deliver. You know, if democracy is to be meaningful, if democracy is to have firm roots, then it must deliver. And for it to be delivered, it must be vibrant. It must address the needs of the people. You know, I think generally there is, uh, you know, there is this concern about people being turned off. You know, they are not engaging. They are not going to vote. So there is also this challenge. You know, how do you make democracy relevant? How do you make democracy or how do you reimagine democracy? And that has to be done in terms of whether it is meeting my expectations, it is delivering my needs. And so one of the needs, of course, is one is peace and stable society. Other is what are the fears, the short term, the medium term and the long term in terms of the individual? You know, what is he or she worried about? And how do we liberate them? How do we make them free from those fears? You know, that, that is what empowerment is all about. So unless, and I think fortunately, you know, if I can just say that, in the constitution of Bangladesh, I don't know about the other constitutions, and I speak as a parliamentarian, there's a very specific chapter which talks about fundamental principles of state policy. And there it identifies basic needs. You know, so it talks about food, it talks about clothing, it talks about shelter, it talks about education, it talks about health. You know, that to me is human security. And human security is not an alternative to human rights. You know, I think human rights are included in the overall concept of human security. Some people may say that we are now trying to push a new narrative. So for parliamentarians, when we talk about rule of law, um, when we talk about you know, rights, individual rights, liberal rights, I mean, those are part of human security. So I think how we how we package this is very important. And Dora, you know, you talked about the the individual lives that uh, we are looking to transform. When we looked at uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, remember the five Ps. You know, we talk about the five Ps. So the five Ps. One is the centrality of people. So everything that you do has people at the very center of it. And then you have peace, you have prosperity, uh, you have the planet. You have the partnership and the sixth P, which is going to be relevant for us, is the paradigm shift. Whether we talk it in terms of approach or tools, you know, whatever it is, uh, whether it is mindset, I think the mindset is much more important. The mindset, not just of the individual uh, policymaker, but the mindset of the people that they're acting on behalf of. You know, and when you look at the US elections, uh, when uh, Trump got elected, many people were saying, and I'm not trying to make a political point here, you know, was Trump cause or effect? You know, did Trump change America or did he understand that America had changed? So I think he got it right in terms of the people who are being left behind, despite all of the poverty, despite all of the economic growth and all of the advances. So I think that is another reason why the individual focus is important. We don't want to leave anyone fall behind. You know, we don't want to see anyone fall behind. So if you really want an inclusive approach, as I said, planning, you start from the bottom. You start with the most basic needs of society. And if we fulfill that, other very important role, social cohesion. 
you know, this also helps us to build on that. And once you have that, you know, once the fabric is, is well knit, then we can move on and, and, and do other things. So I think um, it's important for, for democracy. It's actually a litmus test for democracy, uh, whether people are engaging in democracy. And our job as parliamentarians on Rohan's point, you know, when I was uh, chair of the standing committee, first standing committee, is how do we re-engage with people? So when you ask that question, the next question is, what do you re-engage with? And what you re-engage with is what their needs are, uh, is where they are actually falling behind. Of course, the next challenge then is to fit it into a wider context and framework of the SDGs. Frankly, my experience, Dora, is to many people, SDG is too remote. You know, this is something that people sat in New York and decided. So how we internalize the SDGs. So mm -hmm. I talk about, you know, when I go somewhere, I talk about the individual whose health needs are being met. I talk about the individual you know, who didn't have house, who didn't have land, and I'm providing for him. So I think this is how we as parliamentarians link it to the individual, calibrate our message. There is no one size that fits all. And understanding and appreciating the diversity of needs is what helps us to deliver. Thank you, Sumbara. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think the discussion could go on for long, uh, but uh, I'm reminded that we are over and above our allotted time. Uh, and I want to thank uh, our special guests from IPU, uh, Saber, Dennis in particular, and our partners, Laurence, Arthur, I want to thank Dora. Uh, maybe a last word from Laurence. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we didn't start from you, but again, I think you are the engine of our process in IPU, and uh, you should uh, take the credit for this. So give us really literally two words in terms of how we should be going on, uh, re reaffirm the, the, the commitment uh, for human security. Are you still there? Uh, Laurence, two words, that, that's it. Um, let's continue partnering and promoting human security and, um, and we'll have a nice publication very soon that we can build on and make sure that uh, all parliamentarians will be able to use and to, um, as Dora said, and to inform their constituents so that everybody is aware of what is human security. Thank you. The discussion goes on. Thanks, everybody, and see you soon again. Thank you.